Once again, good morning to everyone. And as it's a time at hand and Millie is in here on her feet, so I guess we're going to copy her and we'll all stand to our feet and have a word of prayer this morning. <laughs> so shall we pray? Father, this once again upon this hour and upon this day that each and every one of us come to you right now, dear Lord, to thank you once again for allowing us to come together inside these walls that we all may discuss and go over what thus saith this your word. As always, we ask truly, Father, that your spirit would be in the midst of it all. I ask right now, Father, that you will bestow just a portion of wisdom on high upon me, dear Lord, that as I bring forth these words, that it may come with clarity, and that we may have a better understanding of it and leave here with more than we brought here today. And dear Lord, may we learn things this day and not by our own benefit. May we also share truly with others. For it is in Jesus' name that we give this prayer. Amen. Well, once again, good morning to everyone. Who's in here ready today for the lesson? I don't hear nothing. Everybody ready for the lesson this morning? Have everybody read your lesson and studied it? We say we've got, got a few no's. Well, I feel a lot more comfortable now because I'm just like you guys. I had one of those crazy weeks, and it happens sometimes. Uh, I'm just going to wing this thing this morning. I really didn't have much time to really get into my studies like I normally would, but thank God for... For years of studying and years of teaching, uh, it's things that we already know. We just have to basically break these things down and go from there. But with those words being said, as you know, today we are in the fourth and final lesson of unit number two. Unit number two, you know, has an overall theme of that of Jesus pleases his father, and it says, by his sacrifices. And each and every one of our lessons have dealt with that, building up to Jesus um, giving his sacrifice. To somewhat go over the previous lesson leading up to now, and to close out this unit, our first lesson dealt with submitting to the Father's will and coming out of the gospel according to Matthew. As you recall, in this lesson, we open up with how Jesus now was having the Passover meal with his apostles. At this time, Judas Iscariot has already made plans or made agreement with the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the elders of the people to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He will betray them by, when they find him, it will be the one that he would kiss. That is the one he says that you would grab. Jesus is now back at the upper room with his disciples, and it says here that they sang a hymn and they went out into the Mount of Olives. Jesus takes these 11 apostles with him. He tells eight of them to stay here and takes three more with him further, who were Peter, James, and that of John. And he tells them, watch and, um, as he goes and prays to his father. And he says he goes off by a stone's throw. And it says that he prays pretty much the same prayer um, three times. And that prayer was that if this cup, <coughs> it'd be possible for this cup to pass away from him, he would w we wish it would. But he said, but nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. And then we find that now Judas Iscariot and the Pharisee, the Sadducees, the uh, elders, the Roman soldiers come with sticks and staves and spears and swords and clubs and torches to arrest Christ. As they come before Christ and Christ presents himself to them, it says they all fall to the ground. And then when Judas comes to Christ, he says, Master, and he kisses him on the cheek. And then they arrest Jesus. That was our first lesson. Our next lesson then dealt with that of crucified for sinners. This lesson was somewhat of a direct continuation of the previous lesson. But as we know, we went from the arrest to that of being upon the cross. So we know right there some things were missing. And as we talked about this, the writer does not have the time or really to put all things in place. So some things they, you would say, skip over and they allow in the facilitator or teacher to fill in the gaps. The gaps that we filled in were things that were missing was, first of all, there was a trial, and then there was the chastisement and the beating. And we know the trial was a, you could call it a mock trial or a fixed trial from the very start. In other words, the outcome was already predetermined. And we know this because of the fact that when they arrested Jesus, remember they questioned him, and they asked him about his teachings and that of his preachings. So therefore, when they asked him this question, Jesus, by following the law, you know, you have to establish your witness by two or three. And whenever you give witness, you're giving testimony. When you give testimony, you're giving facts to what you know to be that which is true. So Jesus does one thing. He just follows the law by having witnesses. He said, well, ask these here what it is that I said. They were there to hear these words. And you remember what happened next? Anybody knows? When Jesus gave his testimony, what was the next thing that happened? You might take a guess. 
What did they do to Jesus? How about that? Did that narrow it down anymore? Now, what I mean by a predetermined conclusion, he gave testimony, and the very next thing they did was smack him in his face. So how dare you talk to the high priest in such a manner? And all he said was, ask these individuals here what it is that I said. So that lets you know right there that anytime you're in trial and you're giving testimony, you get smacked in the face for it, your outcome is already predetermined. So after these things happen, you'll find that then we show some highlights of the theme of the passion of the Christ and all that Christ went through and all that he suffered. We showed that primarily to show some of the things that Christ went through so we could have a deeper significance of what it means when it said, this do in remembrance of me. So then you'll find that Christ was beaten. And then another part actually we didn't cover it. Also, we dealt with the, um, the cross being carried to Golgotha's Hill, or some call it Calvary. And as he goes here, you'll find he now he hangs on the cross between, it said, two transgressors, one on his left and one on his right. Now, I told you an interesting fact that you'll find in other writings and you'll find in the books of the Apocrypha. I think the writer is Nicodemus. A thief was on his left, right, and a thief was on his right. What was the names of those individuals? Anybody remember? Gitmus was one. Gitmus was one who was on his left. Now, of course, both of them spoke against him, but Gitmus was the one that was unrepentant. He was the one who said, you save others, save yourself. But then you had one on the right. Anybody remember his name? Brenda got the first one. Who got the second one? The one on the right, his name was Didmus. And it says of Didmus that he was saying, basically, leave this man alone. For we are guilty of the crimes that we have committed, but this man has done nothing. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's when Jesus says these words, thou shalt be with me today in paradise. As we know, shortly thereafter, Jesus now hangs upon that cross and he lays down his life. Because did they kill him? There you go. You got that one right. They didn't kill him. Jesus said, I got power to lay it down, and I got power also to, to pick it back up. But he gives up his life now, and it says that he dies. And then that brings us to our next lesson, which now comes out of John, which was that of risen from the dead. Now, as you know, with all these lessons, we dealt with Matthew, we dealt with John, and so on from there. Uh, just so we're on the same page, because it's going to continue through this lesson and the next few lessons, that when I'm talking about certain things about Christ, if you're following along in your Bibles, you'll find there's many things you'll say, wait a minute, I hear what Kenny's saying, but I don't see it here. That's because I'm using all the Gospels and putting all the pieces together to get the full story. Because each writer tells the story in their own way and presents it in their own style. Because in this lesson that we have of last week, Risen from the Dead, you'll find John ju does just that. We start off by saying risen is a verb which means to arise, to, to get up, to stand up. And Christ has risen, it says, from the dead. And then we said explanation mark, which means excitement. In other words, it was a good thing. And we talked about what Good Friday in all means. But outside of Good Friday, we also said that the writer in, in the title had these words in parentheses that said what? In last week's title, Easter. Hmm? It says Easter. And we said just as the children of Israel would always rehearse with the people each celebration and why they were having it so they would understand their history, we said, what is Easter and what is Resurrection Sunday? Are they the same? Are they different? Do they have anything in common? And we talked in detail how one really is one thing and one is totally another. To give you a short review of that, Resurrection Sunday basically is a day that gave Christmas its significance. In other words, the one that we celebrate that was born on this day we call Christmas, the time where Christians come together in masses. That's why they call it Christmas or Christmas. You'll find that this is the day on Resurrection Sunday why we know that he is a Savior. Because guess what? He rolls up with all power in his hand on that great getting up morning. It was a week-long celebration of the Passover, the Holy Week, leading up to what we call Resurrection Sunday. So we say, well, what is Easter? Well, Easter, you'll find, has nothing to do with Resurrection Sunday. It's two separate things. We said overall Easter today is something that commercialized, and it's a fun time for kids and baskets and hunting of eggs and so on. Because nobody today I know of is celebrating a goddess by the name of Estra. Most of them say, what are you talking about? I never heard of that before. I thought this was some fun and games thing. But they're two totally different things in and of themselves when you say Easter and Resurrection Sunday. And also, we told you that originally there was no such thing as Easter Sunday. 
Because you remember, they celebrated her the whole entire week. It was no specific day that they looked upon, but Resurrection Sunday is a particular day that we talk about. But over time, the two became tied in with each other to a certain extent. And the biggest mistake you hear each year from the churches is happy Easter Sunday, because this is the day Christ is rose. Like, uh, you can call it Easter for fun with the kids, but this is actually Resurrection Sunday that we have before us. And this was this lesson dealt with how Christ rose from the dead. In this lesson, you'll find that we dealt with the writer of John. And you remember, John told it from his own perspective, because John talks about who come into the gravesite, who come into the sepulchre to see Christ. And last week's lesson, you can look at that. Who came, who was going to the grave to see Christ? And, uh, how can I put this? You're right, but not with last week's lesson, though. See, that's what I mean by all the gospels come together. Remember John last week talked about Mary Magdalene was going to the grave? Now, keep in mind, as you know, a lot of people went to the grave, right? didn't they? Mary, the other Mary, Salome, and so on, and the list goes on from there. A lot of women went, but John, in telling his story, he only concentrated upon one person, and that was Mary Magdalene. But you put all the gospels together, you see those other people. But once again, he just telling it in his own way, because this is a woman that uh, Christ had cast out, I think, seven uh, demons out of her. But as we recall, she was now going, uh, we just go concentrate upon her, put it this way. She's going now to the grave, and there's a giant stone that was there, but was rolled away. And when she gets to the sepulchre, she looks in, and guess what? She sees the, the linen cloth, but his body's not there. You remember, she then runs back, and she tells the apostles that his body is gone. And other scriptures say that she said the body was stolen. Then we find it was Peter and John who ran to the grave. Now, as they run to the grave, it says John overtook Peter and got there first. And read it out close enough last week, we said John got there, and how did he go into the sepulchre? That's right, he didn't go into the sepulchre. It said he came, and he stooped, and he peered in. He looked, saw the linen cloth, and he steps back. But then it says, who came? Peter came behind him, and it says, but Peter went, straight in to see these things. And as Peter goes in, he sees the body is not there. He said he wondered about these things. And that lesson ended with how they now have gone back to the room they were locked away in. And they were wondering about this thing. And then it says that Christ appeared b before them all. Otherwise, Christ just, boom, he's here. The door is locked off and Christ shows up. That's how that lesson ended. But you'll find if you tie the other gospels in, they add things there that John does tell you. And once again, everybody presents in their own way. To really lead into the story, there were two other individuals who came there also. What we have here going on now, leading to this lesson, is this. Christ has now risen from the grave. There are these two disciples on the road headed to a village by the name of Emmaus. As they are heading there, they are talking about the things that had happened. They are sad about this. And Christ appears on the roadway with them. But the word said Christ held back from them who he was. So some kind of way they didn't recognize, understand that this was Christ with him. And he asked them, what is this you're talking about? And what's so sad going on? And they said, are you a stranger around here? Know you not what has happened to this man called Jesus of Nazareth, a great prophet of God, who the Pharisees now people crucified upon the cross. And he died. And this is now, uh, they said, the third day and so on from there. And that's when Jesus began to talk to them and said, know you not the things that must happen to the Messiah. And he preached Moses all the way up to himself in relationship to the, prophets, uh, the prophecies. Then they arrive at this village. And as they arrive at that village, Jesus now says that he has to leave them. But they invite him to stay a little bit longer. But as he stays there with them and they break bread, it says, then their eyes were open and they realized that it was Jesus who was before them. But as they realized it was Jesus, it says that Jesus disappeared before their very eyes. These two individuals now, guess what they do? They head off to Jerusalem. And when they go to Jerusalem, they go to the apostles and they tell them that they have seen the risen Savior. And as they're talking about these things, that's what it says here. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. So this is opening to our lesson this morning. These two disciples now have come up to let Jesus, uh, let disciples know that uh, Christ now is risen. Now keep in mind, when we said, as they thus spoke, uh, these two disciples, in the Bible, I said as many times, oftentimes you will see that term disciple. A disciple is a student, a learner, a follower. 
a lot of times we look at it as just he talking about the 12. But in many cases, guess what? When he said disciple, he's talking about anybody who's a believer. These two disciples are speaking of some try to pin one of the apostles name upon them, but they were two totally different individuals who were there. In fact, you look at the scriptures. It says that the apostle was locked in a room with others. And that's how they exactly were it with others. So other people were there also. But as they are there, it says Jesus now appeared in the very midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. How did Christ get in? To a room that was locked. We just accept it as that? You spirit? Hmm? Well, Carol, I'm going to have to agree with you and others 100%. Hey, he said he, he appeared. And I'm going to leave it just as that. Now, we might not can understand how things happen because we only think of things on what, whose level? Our level. But there are things of God that we have no understanding of. That's why the word tells us that our thoughts, his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither thoughts he is. His thoughts are higher above in heaven that eyes have not seen, even heard. Although we can't even begin to imagine how things function. But we do see a somewhat of a difference here. And the difference we see is that earlier you'll find that Christ was fully God, but he was also what? Fully man. And he didn't use any of his divine powers for self. In fact, scripture says, he who was rich became poor that we might become rich. In other words, Christ, you could say to a certain extent, gave up his deity, his power to do certain things. But now you'll find that even though now he has taken back upon him this physical body of flesh and blood, you'll find that now he can appear any way he wants to appear. In other words, the doors are locked, and there he is standing before them out of nowhere. And when this happens, his next words is to them is what, according to our scriptures? What does he say to them? Yeah. It's not a trick question, guys. He says, peace be unto you. In the Hebrew tongue, is one word they use that says that. Anybody know what that word is? In Hebrew? You hear the Jewish say it all the time. They say these words, and you can say, oh, I should have known that. Shalom. Shalom means peace be unto you, or peace be around you. So basically, Jesus appears before them out of nowhere and says, peace be unto you. Jesus appears out of nowhere and says, shalom. I think you would have to do that. Because guess what? Somebody just appears out of nowhere in a locked house, you might be a little bit spooked, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, you might be a little bit spooked. And Jesus now appears and said, peace be unto you. But one of the things that I see here is that it is amazing is this. Remember we talked about how all Christ went through and all how all he suffered? But we talked more than just physically. Remember that part? We talked about emotionally, how he suffered. Anybody remember that part? Why did I say he, is, he suffered emotionally? Let's see if we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. We may say human, but, but why was he suffering emotionally? Outside of the chastisement of the whipping. Didn't you, Bush? Ah. What I'm getting at, folks, that's something that people often miss. We always think about the whips, the beatings, the crown of thorn upon his head, taking the reed of his hand and beating him over the head with his tearing flesh from his body, but also emotionally. Once again, Christ handpicked by praying to God 12 individuals who he taught and endowed with powers and all. But yet, one of his very own betrayed him. That cuts to your heart. One of your very own was the one who betrayed you. And not only that, you had 11 others who said that we're going to be with you to the very end. And when they came, Scripture said, how many forsook him? And then they did what? Well, they, they forsook him and fled. They all left. And then not only that, one of his closest inner circle, a man by the name of Peter, denied him three times before the cock even crowed. That cuts to your heart. And then not only that, think about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders of the people. All of these were supposed to be God-fearing people who knew God. These were the ones he tried to, as we said earlier, give them the plan of salvation when he was talking to them about healing the, the man at the, at the fool of Beth, um, Beth Esther. Um, allowed the man to walk. And remember, they, they was questioning about this, and he was giving them who he was by saying, I can do nothing but what the Father tells me. If you believe in me and the one that's, believe my Father and the one that sent me, you will have everlasting life. These people he was trying to witness to, the church folks, they denied him. Wouldn't have nothing to do with him. And then as John 3.16 says, he came into the world to save the world, not to destroy the world, but the world to him may be saved. 
as he hung upon that cross, everybody who walked by said, did what? Wagged their heads at him and just reviled him. So in other words, everybody that I came to save rejected him. So now you had that emotional torment. But here's the question I have for you this morning, folks. You went through all that, right? Let's say you went through similar things, right? And the first thing it says is, and as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. Jesus comes back to the very ones who have rejected him. If somebody has rejected you, shunned you, pushed you away, would you go back to them? He goes back now to lift them up. We said, digging, digging the dome. Mm-mm. That's right. Let's speak honestly. You know, think about, and of course they didn't do this, but remember people spit upon him. They beat him. Said all kinds of things about him. And then Jesus is back for all these people that he died for. Because as he went up on that cross, remember he had no sin. I had a phone call this week and the question was asked, uh, for, don't lose train of thought, Carol. Um, person asked me, said, what did scripture say about God and what he went through when Christ was upon the cross? He said, I'm just trying to find something. I can't seem to find anything. I said, no, you won't find anything about what God went through. But you can have an understanding of what God went through. I said, because just so you know, Christ was upon that cross. It said from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which means from 12 to, to 3, the world went dark. And Christ said these words, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? I said, here you have a father now that the son says, why have you forsaken me? I said, but in reality, he didn't forsake his son. It was a lesson for us. Christ at that point represented sin in this world. God will let people know that he accepts sin in no shape, form, or fashion, even that from his very son. So it lets you know that if he can turn away from his son, we need to ask forgiveness for our sins. But keep in mind, Christ was just a representation of it because Christ had no sin. He just bore our sins. But Dick Bush? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm hmm. Right. Then the next question to that is are we accepting of our mission? In other words, Christ set the example, as Carol just said. This is what he had to do. But he's letting us know somebody spoke against you, said all kinds of bad words about you. Would you go back and do something for them? Easily, we could have said, they spoke against me, they reviled me, they spat upon me, they're on their own. But yet you find that even though that stuff was done to Christ, Christ still came back to save those which are lost. Can we do the same thing? When we've been wrong, but we said, well, you're on your own now, buddy. And many times, guess what? That is the case. Mm -hmm. we, we are a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But we see here, as we go a little bit further, it says, As they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. It says, But they were what? Terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. They're terrified. Jesus appeared out of nowhere. And what do we have here? Fear has come upon them. Fear. Uh, I get a little deepness as we go into the next scripture here in a moment. This relates back to, now, we can't say this is what he thought or felt, but it seems like what was going on. Once again, it seems like what was going on. The scripture doesn't tell us that. Remember when they ran to the tomb? John ran past Peter, right? John gets there first. And John did what again? Stop. It says he stooped. Scripture says he stooped in and peered in. Why do you think he, would, he didn't go in? Scared of what? <laughs> it's something to think about. Think about it. He, 
them. Think of all that Christ had did, right? In his lifetime with them. And how he did them, but look out after you, you know, taught you the right things, said the right things. You watch him heal people, raise folks from the dead. Do, you watch him do it all. And you thought he would be there for you, shall we say, through a lifetime. But now he's taken away. And he's in a tomb. And you got this report that the body's not there. You rush to the tomb, but then you stop. Just short. It begs the question what? You know, it could have been maybe he thought somebody took the body, and maybe they're still there. Scripture doesn't tell us that. But it seems to be, once again, it seems to be some fear had come in. Remember we talked about this last week when you have um, home-going celebrations, you have the body uh, viewing, and you have it at a set time. Remember that last week? And you have a set time, it's going to end at 7 or whatever, or from 5 to 7. You get there about 4.15, and somebody's already standing out there like this, outside. <laughs> but I know where I'm going with this. And you said, uh, you going in? I'll wait for somebody to come here first. <laughs> what are you afraid of? Bertie, if your dad was here right now, he's always joking with us and said, I always tell him these words. You ain't got to worry about nobody inside this building bothering you. The ones you better fear is the ones outside walking around. But it's amazing how that fear comes in. But yet we see Peter, though. Peter goes right in. Peter doesn't know what has happened here now. He just knows his body has gone because it hasn't come, thought hasn't even come to his mind that guess what? He is resurrected. Thought has not even come. But now as you could say Jesus appears right before their very eyes, it says that they are terrified and frightened that they have seen a spirit. And it's amazing how the demonic things people will run to and attract to, but the things of God people are afraid of. You know, you'll find that you'll see movies and stuff, horror movies, people flock to them. Got to go see those movies. They got to go see the demonic ones. I can go see my fortune teller, scratch my palm and tell me what's going on here and there. I got to look in the paper and my zodiac signs, all these things. But the things of God, when he gets to those, all of a sudden now we are afraid. And Jesus even asked that question, he says in verse 38, and he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? In other words, he's asking, why are you afraid? I got a tricky question to ask you this morning. Y'all ready for it? Let's just say, let's, let's just come to this question. What are we afraid of? Death or resurrection? Never heard it put that way before, have you? What are you afraid of, death or the resurrection? And the only reason I ask that question is because of things that I have experienced. And once again, who has experienced these things? Things I've experienced and seen. What are we afraid of, death or the resurrection? Well, it says death. Jesus would ask the question, why are you afraid of death? That's what Jesus would ask. Because he said death has no sting, it has no victory. But guess what, Christians... Many are still what? Afraid of it. And which our very being, our very existence to this faith hinges upon what? The resurrection. There was one time, I think it was, was it Paul? To the church at Corinth. He says that, now we preach Christ resurrected. How says some among you there be no resurrection? If there be no resurrection, is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And he says, and your faith is all in vain. It's all for nothing. But the reason why I ask that question is I've seen people talk about can't wait to get to heaven. Have you heard that before? Oh, we're going to walk the streets of gold. Landed, they say every day going to be Sunday. And we shall rejoice all the day long. No more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrows. I shall once again see my loved ones face to face. But even better than that, I get to look upon Jesus himself. You know, and we sing the songs. You know, we'll all get to heaven. What a glorious time that would be. When we all get to heaven, we shall sing and shout what? The victory. Then they'll say, how you doing today? Well, I'm doing a whole lot better than some. Because some didn't rise up this morning. You're like, wait a minute, I thought heaven was so great. He'll say, good to see you today. And they'll say, well, it better be seen than it is be viewed. Sound like a contradictory statement. Since heaven is so good, they say, well, good to see you today. They say, well, yeah, any day above ground. It's better than the day below ground. To the world, Christians sends forth a mixed message in that regard. 
but how we view death. But yet, the resurrection, how do we feel about that? We've all been to homegrown celebration, haven't we? And we've all had said or had family members say, I wish that person was back here today. I would love to see them one more time because to me, the saddest part about any homegrown celebration is when the coffin closes. And I've always been at every funeral I've been at, even yesterday's funeral. When that coffin closes, I say a prayer as it closes because I know for a season, you would not see that person physically. Now, you know what I say? I say it for a season, right? That means you're going to see him again, but for a while, you won't see him. But then when that coffin closes, you know, like, well, that's it for a while. You won't see him. Now, that's a sad moment. And people say, oh, I wish they was back. And I can tell you this. If that was to happen, and that coffin closes, get totally quiet, and rolls, you hear this in front of that coffin. <laughs> Inside the coffin. Jack, that's one time nobody waiting for the ushers to open the doors. I can tell you that. Everybody going to be out that church running. But yet we say we want to see a resurrection. I'm looking up and saying, we're afraid of death. And are we afraid of the resurrection also? That's what kind of comes into play when I read the statement when Jesus says, it said, and they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he, and this should be capitalized because it's talking about Christ. It says, and he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? So Jesus asked them, why are you so afraid? So the question is, why do we act that way about death? Resurrection, if somebody was to open a coffin or the coffin was to open back up, how would we respond? Usually it seems to be with fear. And the question is, why? When you deal with the things of God, why are we afraid? God tells us all, just come unto him. You want to hear my answer to that? Now, some would say, because it's the unknown, it's the so-and-so. I get all that. But what, for me, what I, what I see, once again, what I see there is basically an area of growth in your faith. Your faith is not what it should be. Or we haven't arrived to where we are supposed to be, especially pertaining to this thing called death. Because the very reason Christ went to the cross is to show you that he had power over death. Pastor preached last week, is Buddha alive? Is Muhammad alive? And what you got? You got Confucius and all the other ones. Line them all up. None of them alive. But only one rose up to say he had victory. And that was Christ. And it's not a great testimony when the Christians still show doubt about those very same things. It means your faith still has to earn to grow. There was only one individual I can think of right now, passed up here. Pastor, the only one I can think of right now is, was it Paul, was the only one I know of that looked forward to death. That's the only one. Paul said in one statement that he desired, he longs to be with Jesus. That's where he wanted to be. He said, but I have need also here. In other words, he had a job to do to save as many as he could before he go on. But he wanted to go and be with the Lord. And even when his time came up, when, when Nero was about to execute him, he said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have stayed the course. But most of all, he said this, I have kept the faith. There was no fear there because he knew what his Lord and Savior had done for him. Jesus now standing before his apostles. He had told them all, taught them all these things leading up to this point, but they still hadn't got it. And this is why he said in 38, and he said unto them, why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? To, for the common in 39, he says this, behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit have not flesh and bones as you see me have. Why did Jesus have to come back in the flesh? Why couldn't he just be a spirit? Any answer to that, any response to that? They thought they had seen a spirit. Why didn't he just come back as a spirit? Why did he come back flesh and bones? That to prove the resurrection. In other words, this body now is going to rise again. But keep in mind, it's still in a temporary body. That's just the body Jesus has that's before us. He said, because spirits don't have bones and blood and, and flesh and whatnot. But to show you he had power over death, he came back once again in that physical form. Scripture even says that the day shall come when we shall have a body like his. Now, we don't know what it's going to be, Scripture says, but we do know we should have a body that is like his. But at this point, he comes back. 
in the form of flesh and blood. He said, Behold my hands and my feet. He wanted them to know with certainty that it was definitely him who stood before them. And then he says, And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they believed not for joy and wondered, he said to them, Have you here any meat? So in other words, Jesus showed himself. They still didn't believe. They had great joy, but they still didn't believe it was him. At risen, then he says these words, give me something to eat. Now, why he needs something to eat? Spirits don't eat. Exactly. Spirits do not eat. But flesh and blood need something to nourish the body. He was showing you now that he had total victory over death. The body now has arisen. He says, see my hands, see my feet. The scripture says, he said, handle me. Touch these places where you're going. And do you also know that this is a small bit I'm not going to teach you right now. There was one other apostle, it seems to be, that had seen Christ before they had. So we always believe that he came back to the room. Can remember how many doubted? I thought it just was Thomas. You know, people always give Thomas bad names at doubting Thomas. All of them doubted. It's just that when they saw him, Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas said, when I see it for myself, I believe just as they did. But you'll look in the scriptures, you'll see when these two men from Emmaus came there, they said Christ has written, and he's already appeared to Simon. That's a very small footnote they put there. Who is Simon? Anyone know who Simon is? That's Peter. So he already had appeared to Peter. But that's a whole other story to bring up. But now you'll find that Christ presents himself to them to show that he has arisen. It says, and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So what Jesus now done is, you could say, broke bread with them. And he's explaining to them the same things that he talked to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He started from Moses and all the prophecies that led up to Christ to that point had been fulfilled. Because one thing about Christ, you have to always remember is this. All prophecy pointed to Christ, and all prophecy was fulfilled leading up to Christ. So therefore, he showed you that God's word is true, God's word is just. It said, then opened he their understanding that they may understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. In other words, he's going back to the, you could say, the foundation of our faith. And that is what? The resurrection. We have to believe in the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, Paul said later, all that you're doing is vain. It's all for naught. And then it says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among some nations, beginning, oh, once again, I had that bad translation here. I'm glad you guys got a, got a better one. Name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, why did everything have to start at Jerusalem? What make them so much better than everybody else? Or are they better than anybody else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it started that there because that goes back to the covenant. When God said, I shall bless thee and thou shalt be a great nation. And the word first will start with the nation of Israel because of the love that he had for Abraham. Not that he was better than anybody else, but it's going to start in Jerusalem first and then the word's going to go forth to the rest of the nation. And Christ always stuck to his father's plan. Because remember when Christ preached, he came to the nation of Israel first. When Paul brought for his message, who did Paul start it with? We know him as Paul, Saul. Remember who started with the nation of Israel, but they rejected him? But he said, I did what I supposed to do. I started with you first, but since you have rejected the message, now I'm going to carry it to the Gentiles themselves. So it had to start there and then spread to the rest of the world. It's no different than when Christ told his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And they said he was who? Moses, John the Baptist. Elijah, one of the great prophets and so on. He says, after they gave him all these different scenarios, he said, but who do you say I am? Now, I'm not looking for who they said he was, but the question was why did he asked him that question. 
know where the heart was. Mm-hmm. And what, what else can we add to what Dick Jones said? He's right with that. Well, he asked his disciples that question. You know what their heart was, but what else you want to know from them? It's what Dick Bush you just illustrated to. They had to have a clear understanding of who Christ was. Imagine those 12 apostles, because remember, Christ's ministry was short ministry. So they had to take over and lead from there. Just imagine everybody had a different gospel they were preaching. Well, the gospel we today. You got, you got these 11 individuals going out, and this one's saying this, and this one's saying that, and this one's saying that. So Christ said, well, first of all, we have to get it right here first so we can go out to the rest of the world. So who do you say that I am? Because the world obviously doesn't know or have a clear understanding. Everybody's claiming to be I'm one of these great prophets who have come here before, but who do you say that I am? That was also, you have to get it straight here first, then you care to the rest of the world. But as we close this thing out, he says, mm, where did I stop at? 48, and ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. That's dealing when Pentecost will come and the Holy Spirit shall come upon them. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. But what we find there in, once again, Luke's illustration here, some things are left out, aren't they? It looks like here he just talked to his apostles, came out of them, and went up to heaven. But we know, according to Scripture, he stayed another 40 days. And it said it was seen by over 500. And the Word says, and many of them were still alive at that point at the writing of the Scripture. So in other words, Christ appeared to the people for a while, a little over a month, before he actually ascended back into heaven. But in that account, they said in a different way. This is why I always say in, in closing that whenever you're reading about Christ, you have to look at all the Scriptures and put all the pieces together. Because if you don't, you'll say, wait a minute, somebody's contradicting one. It's like, no, each one of them just telling it from their own perspective. Give you an example. When Mary Magdalene came to that, that um, tomb and Christ wasn't there, remember she went back and told them? But he said, but didn't the word say the angel talked to her? Yes, because evidently she came back. The angel said, why do you come here looking for a dead man? But he is risen. And then he says to them, go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee as I have told them. And remember, then she goes back. And it says that their words seen, or her words seem to them as but idle tales. In other words, they didn't even believe it then. So this is how you have to put all the scriptures together to get the full understanding of what um, Christ is all about and the life that he led the entire time he was here. You can't just look at one particular gospel and follow that. It's kind of difficult be, to be jumping around, but you have to put them all together to get the full understanding of the story. Dick and Jones? The scripture says 40. 50? Well, I think scripture says... It mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. 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 Because after he ascended back, at those 50 days, let me say stay here until the Spirit, you've been down with the Spirit. Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. It was now 50 days. Pentecost started, and that's when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, who at that point, remember, the apostles were kind of quiet. But then he said he stood up boldly and began to preach Jesus Christ from that day forth. So you're, you're right with, with those numbers that come forth. But at Pentecost itself, that word means 50, just like Lent means 40. And you see they all tie in together. But with that closing word, I think I just cut my Bible off. Next week lesson, next week lesson, who has it? I'll turn my laptop back on. It's entitled The Bread of Life. Next week, we're going into a new unit. And this deals with Jesus pleased his Father, it says, by his teachings. And our lesson is entitled The Bread of Life, coming out of, once again, the Gospel according to John. But keep in mind, the words that you have there, there are going to be many things I'm going to add to it because John doesn't tell the complete story as the other gospel writers um, have told it. So with that being said, shall we rise to our feet for a closing word? And just keep in mind today, he, he's humble and never wants us to bring it up. Um, uh, that's just in nature. Today is the pastor's anniversary. And some say, it's the pastor's anniversary? Yes, it's the pastor's anniversary. Why don't we announce it? Because he always tells us, 
He's just doing his job, doing his duty. He never really wants to talk about it, but we give him credit. But he's the pastor that God has placed before us. And this is his, uh, I think it's 13th, 13th anniversary. So with those words being said, Dick and Bush, if you will, give us a closing word. 